Hello traders, it's Tuesday, April the 25th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for the opening 24 hours of trade this week. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the coming 24 to 48 hours ahead. Well, the opening session was, with little exaggeration, remarkable, uh, especially for the FX market, when we had a dramatic jump in euro uh, across the board, as well as a number of risk-oriented assets. Now, uh, that can range from anywhere between European-based equity indexes like the DAX uh, to the S&P 500 back in the United States uh, to uh, even emerging markets. The theme was pretty consistent. Remarkable performance, significant gaps, very limited follow-through. Uh, but what was at the root of this? Too many times we see a big move, we don't really consider what was the driver. And without considering what is the driver, I see developments like the Euro USD's uh, drive here, the gap higher, and the immediate assumption is revert to technicals, close the gap. That would be a hasty call. We'll talk about that why uh, today, just like we talked about in the uh, webinar uh, for the fundamental forecast. But we could also see not just a uh, reversion uh, being put at risk, but even progress, uh, so a technical break. Whereas uh, many more people would be cautious about the Euro USD gap up uh, and would be more prone to trade the range that it produced and uh, that it seems to have. I think a lot, a lot less uh, of the market would be uh, reticent to actually trade this very clear, very clean head and shoulders neckline break for the euro, for the dollar, all right, which is heavily influenced by the euro USD. However, this technical break, as clean as it looks, comes with significant baggage, not just fundamental baggage, but market conditions baggage. And when you're trying to stack up a trade against too much headwind, it becomes a lower and lower probability endeavor. Not impossible, certainly, but it is not the high probability event that you try to look for day in, day out, so that you can make a consistent rate of return. So let's take a look at this. Euro USD. Little, re, uh, little doubt about what was the motivator here. Uh, it was plastered all over the headlines. We certainly covered it very well on daily effects, uh, but that was the outcome of the U.S., or sorry, the U.S., the French first round election. The French elections uh, actually had the outcome that most had anticipated, where the two leading candidates in the opinion polls had actually made it through the first round. Uh, the uh, remainder of the candidates would uh, essentially be dropped off the presidential ticket and the runoff would be between the two leading contenders. That would be Marcon and Le Pen. Now, Marcon is a centrist. The way that I see it and the way that the markets have been seeing it, think back to the November U.S. presidential election, Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Think back to the Brexit vote back in June 23rd, 2016. Leave versus Remain. Remain was status quo for the UK. Leave was the dramatic change. The outcome was the dramatic change outcome, and subsequently the pound collapsed. For the US presidential election, Hillary Rodham Clinton was considered to be the status quo, where Donald Trump was significant change. Markets don't like significant change, but when the candidate, uh, at least for the U.S. Uh, perspective, uh, of significant change was oriented towards uh, significant tax reform, that would be business friendly, and an infrastructure spending program, which he has uh, vowed to pursue, uh, would implicate faster growth and uh, also faster interest rate expectations. The market's move was dramatic. Had it been Hillary Clinton, it would probably be much more restrained. Okay, This is the kind of mentality that the market is working on. Previously, the assumption would have been status quo, and then the it would seem that the markets would not be even uh, referencing this very important event risk and are just ignoring everything and anything. As it happens, the two surprises that we had before had the market in hypervigilance, and subsequently we had the kind of response that we did on Monday. 
the outcome does lead uh, or does leave the centrist candidate the no change status quo not a, a measure on their full policies not certainly not an implication of their social uh, programs but more so on the market's perspective for Le Pen, who is uh, backed by a very uh, uh, bombastic campaign to withdraw France from uh, the EU, uh, or at least call the referendum for it, as well as withdraw from the euro. That would be a systemic risk for the euro. And her candidacy would be considered a threat to this currency. So the outcome, as we saw, it saw a big jump. Clearly, these two candidates are still in contention. Either can win, but the probabilities have significantly changed after the first round to the second round. That's because the votes that would have gone to the other uh, contenders that were in the initial uh, phase are starting to consolidate behind the centrist view making the anti-EU, anti-Euro uh, views of Le Pen uh, far less likely to be realized. Now, don't write it off. Certainly don't. But at the same time, this doesn't come to the same kind of statistical uh, imbalance that we had in the final days, final weeks of the U.S. presidential election, certainly not to the Brexit, which was neck and neck the entire way. So it's not a surprise that the euro does get a relief rally. We can see actually from the euro volatility index that it also had a steep decline. All right, now back to the euro USD. This relief is palpable. All right, the euro's systemic threat is abated significantly. But now what's the next move? Does the euro keep rallying? because a centrist might uh, win the French election? Unlikely. Is there still a lot of discount that can be worked off? There might be some discount, but probably not to the same degree that we had before. How can I tell? The Euro Volatility Index. All right. That's the kind of hedge risk that was worked off. So while I wouldn't say closing the gap on the euro USD is, is something that we could just do on a technical basis alone and a Ron Popeil method is set it and forget it. It can work out if we see a market that reverts to its norm. What's its norm? Well, as we've been seeing with most markets, including uh, benchmarks like the S&P 500, is consolidation the past few months. If we revert back to market conditions that are more range oriented, then that reversion is going to work out well with some technical resistance and the euro USD set to drift would more likely make a uh, path of least resistance move back into its range. Now, that wouldn't be a fast gap close because it's not technicals that are motivating it. It's a combination of all of it. But this helps us to put it into context. If we don't see this gap close, because as I pointed out uh, earlier uh, in Monday's session in the webinar, the gap that we had from the cable immediately after the Friday close, after the tremendous drop off on the sterling, the subsequent uh, week never saw that gap close, and we haven't to this day. All right, this is a fundamental consideration as much as it is a technical consideration. In fact, it's more so. So if you're going to trade the euro USD for a gap, don't just do it from a technical basis. Think of the fundamentals and the market conditions that go behind it. The same is true of the euro pound and all the other euro crosses. This is a tremendous gap back up. This actually has stalled a head and shoulders pattern. This will revert now back to Brexit. All right. The ECB rate decision on Thursday is also going to be a high profile influence for this currency cross. Pound yen, which we had a significant break higher. It seemed uh, we made that clean technical break after the snap election. Or sorry, we're going the wrong direction. Euro yen. Uh, we had that massive break back up, which typically, uh, or was the substantial support, come back up. Former support, new resistance, 118, cleared it easily. But closing the gap is now uh, more so a dependency on risk trends, like all yen crosses. And we'll get to risk trends in just a second because it had a profound influence on this event risk as well. 
Euro Swiss. Finally, Swiss National Bank has a break. The pressure of a constantly devalued euro, a depreciating euro, uh, is uh, taken off for at least for a, a, a day's reprieve. Uh, but uh, they're they're happy to let it go. Euro CAD, Euro Aussie, Euro Kiwi, all of it is the same. The gap is significant, but don't expect a immediate filling of that gap. But also don't expect that. And I've been watching the Euro Kiwi closely because I like the medium to long term view of this but I don't think that this gap higher is going to be natural course for continuation because the presidential election in France is not going to be that key catalyst for follow through we've worked off a lot of what it uh, the impact that it had unless Le Pen uh, ends up uh, winning the second round but we're probably going to go in a very different direction if that's the case Let's go back to the Euro USD. All right. Next steps for the Euro. There's a lot of event risk, but the key event risk for the Euro is going to be the ECB rate decision. The European Central Bank is moving from an extreme dovish position, and there was, as of last month, discussion amongst these policy officials to potentially work off their balance sheet. If you recall what happened to the Fed when it started to talk about rate hikes, 2014-2015, the dollar surged. Not so much after it did start hiking, but it was the anticipation that build up to it. Same is probably going to be true of the ECB with the euro. All right, key event risk, watch that for the euro. But from the euro's perspective, or the EURUSD's perspective, the dollar is going to have just as much influence here as well. Going back to that dollar index, all right, gap down breaking a critical trend line and what seems to be the neckline on a head and shoulders pattern. Would you expect follow through? I wouldn't. All right. It's unless there's something else coming along that is going to motivate a sell off in the dollar, the more liquid of the euro USD and the most liquid currency in general overall, then it's probably going to struggle as a follow through. And more likely than not, if it consolidates or rebounds, certainly, uh, we're going to have a false break. So what would motivate the dollar to continue to drop, or if it were to fill the gap in a, for a false break that you see here in the head and shoulders neckline into a rebound? Well, it's going to revert back to U.S.-based event risk. The U.S. event risk to this week, or to start this session, sorry, uh, was relatively light. Kashkari, who I already know his views, although he did say something slightly uh, bearish, not just dovish, bearish. Uh, we had a, in my view, disappointing earnings figure from Alcoa. They might have beat our earnings expectations, but their revenues uh, dropped. Things get heated, and they only build in intensity for the U.S. as the week continues. In the upcoming session, U.S. consumer confidence from the conference board. This is important because sentiment leads to actual reality and economic and financial positions. We get into Wednesday where we have more Fed speak, but more importantly, we are expecting the Trump administration to avail, uh, unveil its uh, the, the borders of its tax reform plan. Perhaps not the entirety of what the details are. We've been waiting for that for a while, uh, but we're going to get what the aim is going to be. And a lot of confidence has built up in dollar positioning since the election, not to mention in risk-oriented positioning in U.S.-based assets since the election based on the tax policies and the assumption of an infrastructure spending program. Thursday, all right, we're going to get uh, a lot of U.S.-based event risk, a lot of cross-currency wins, and then in Friday, we're going to get the U.S. GDP figures amongst a, a intense uh, crosswind from global GDP figures. And then, of course, don't forget that at the end of the week, uh, unless there is a breakthrough and the standoff between the various branches of the government in the United States, uh, the U.S. is on pace to run out of money for uh, financing uh, the government, which leads to its own set of problems. We'll probably dedicate a, str a special uh, strategy video to that. So the dollar has a lot going on, but it needs motivation. 
Anticipation usually dampens motivation for trend development, and we do have to thread a very careful course uh, to feed a, a bearish decline. It's not like we have an assumption of uh, the Trump outcome, the government spending outcome, the GDP outcome, and add to that monetary policy and risk trends. Uh, there are probably not assumptions built into this. I think perhaps if you want to see a dollar-based uh, decline, all right, and extend this to its logical uh, outcome, then you can extend this to other uh, currency crosses. Okay, although the pound dollar didn't move that far, dollar yen is still up, and uh, some of the other uh, risk-oriented currencies didn't necessarily do that poorly for the dollar. But if you want to extend the dollar's decline, I think risk trends will certainly be a big component of that. Although against the yen, the Aussie and the Kiwi, for example, uh, that might not uh, bode uh, too productive a anti-dollar view. But risk trends. You can see here that the S&P 500 jumped significantly, as we talked about. Uh, it wasn't just the euro-based volatility index that dropped. The VIX, the U.S. equity-based S&P 500 derived volatility index dropped as well. One of the lowest readings that we've seen this year, going all the way back to really the summer lull of 2014. This crushed volatility. And for good reason. I mean, the risks that were posed by France were sig significant. We saw uh, considerable ramifications from Brexit and the U.S. election. So it, it, it goes to uh, logic that we would have this kind of pullback in volatility, but to this degree, this is certainly leveraged or intensified by complacency. We also had a significant drop in gold-based volatility. All right. And all those risk-oriented assets, all right, the German equity index, this was a France decision, but German and European indices rose to be expected if the euro crisis is abating uh, or the systemic threat that it was facing abates. Uh, we also had emerging markets, high yield, f far flung risk oriented assets, all performing with a gap and moderate follow through. Does this really carry this event, the kind of positive sentiment necessary to extend this to its next leg higher? A new record high for the S&P 500, uh, a continued uh, optimism for other asset classes. If it's going to struggle with the euro, it's going to definitely struggle with risk-oriented assets as a broad group. This is, as I had insinuated with the VIX, a reflection more of the complacency in the market and the reasoning and the, uh, the opportunism uh, to bid all risk-oriented assets uh, when the opportunities arise, to go in quickly and take advantage of that opportunity and, you know, withdraw. This is not a trend kind of development, not unless there's something else that comes in behind it that says risk on for a more legitimate uh, continuous purpose. So this risk orientation, all right, this is the kind of gap where, yes, it is at risk. The euros, might, maybe not necessarily, depends on market conditions. But for risk on, it certainly does really uh, extend itself to unreasonable proportions. If you really are uh, dedicated to a closing a gap, the euro yen, uh, given the leverage that this represents, is more aligned to those thinkings. But with this view, risk trends are going to be probably very difficult to maintain. The extreme low in volatility, especially considering what the rest of our week represents, particularly from the U.S., but we're talking about uh, the U.S. Consumer Confidence Report, then we get into the BOJ rate decision before the ECB rate decision the subsequent day. Uh, we have considerable number of uh, speeches and meetings that are being, going to be done to a very intense Brexit. We have the Trump administration's tax plan and then the possibility of a U.S. government's uh, shutdown as of Saturday. Uh, we have a range of uh, indicators and data throughout the week, earnings, uh, and of course Friday's run of GDP statistics. This is a lot of anticipation and it's very difficult to imagine that the, there's going to be a record low, or sorry, multi-year low uh, expectation of volatility and risk going into this run. 
reality suggests something very different. All right. So if you are in a long risk position, I would uh, encourage some uh, deep thinking to really assess how confident we are in this position, what are our expectations, our time frame, objectives, and if we have a reasonable stop, or think about the opportunities if risk trends start to slip. If risk trends start to slip, uh, there will be plenty of opportunity to close gaps, but I wouldn't necessarily consider it a full reversal into a full-scale sell-off. All right, that is asking for a lot. It's possible uh, sentiment has a tendency to build upon itself, especially after hitting extremes, which we are extreme complacent and extremely low in the risk metrics. Uh, but it, it has uh, repeatedly uh, fallen short of that self-sustaining cycle. So I would look for much the same of what I'm looking at here in the EURUSD, looking for measured moves even within a range. So be mindful of what the event risks are showing. All right, and the big moves that we get in otherwise extremely quiet markets, they're not all signals that everything is changing. More often, they're signals of temporary mis uh, mislocation of expectations. Quickly snuffed out, but reverting back to the original course. I'm going to be watching the Euro USD, but I'm going to be watching the dollar broadly. Risk trends are at the very top of my list for concerns, and volatility as a separate measure of risk trends, but also as a instrument to trade, as many people are now treating it, uh, in and of itself. I mentioned goal volatility dropping. You can see that we did gap below 1280, uh, but this retains some of its uncertainty because of the event risk as it picks up to the end of this week, especially of U.S. Uh, political and financial condition. A last look at oil. You can see that the march continues, consecutive bars, and certainly a lot of progress down towards the bottom of this well-established rising trend channel. Uh, we're not all the way down at the extreme, which now falls at 48, but it's never a good idea to uh, take profit at the very extremes of ranges, nor is it good to expect that you're going to get all the way to the very bottom of a range uh, before you can mark a ideal entry. Ideals rarely work in markets. All right, so take that into consideration. All right, we'll wrap it up here. I will be out of the office tomorrow, so no trading video tomorrow. I will pick it back up Wednesday evening, and we'll talk about the uh, far more intense event risk as it starts to uh, build when we talk again. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.